Um, I think most of the people who uh, our early starters have joined us now and we'll get the seminar underway. My name is John Denham. I'm the director of the Centre of English Identity and Politics at Southampton University. And we're pleased to be hosting this uh, seminar with British Future. Uh, and we put out a joint publication today. We've got some great uh, speakers. Sundar Katwala from British Future will talk about the research. And then we have Anne Coddington, James Kirkup and David Lammy. Um, David is I think held up by business in the House of Commons at the moment, but will join us as soon as possible. Just a couple of things to say. Um, the event will be recorded and made available on YouTube as soon as we can after the event. Uh, as we go forward, you'll see that there are chat buttons, uh, a chat function for discussions amongst pe people who are uh, following the event. There's also a QA. and a uh, function. If you could use that to pose questions to the panel, that will be very helpful. And there's also the chance there to um, support questions that you would particularly like to be asked. Uh, but it's really helpful if questions to the panel can go under Q&A in case we miss them if they get put in the chat feed. So the background to today is pretty obvious, I think. Um, the Euros start uh, now, for in the next few days, England play on Sunday. It will be a moment where the nation feels English for a period of time. And yet English identity is also contested. There's been a very passionate intervention from Gareth Southgate, the England manager, in the last 24 hours. Today's focus really starts from football and the Euros and the English football team, but broadens out to wider questions of an inclusive Englishness that ju doesn't just materialize when a football tournament is underway, uh, but is part of the lived experience of being in England. And that's what we want to explore in the course of this webinar. Well, that's enough from me by way of introduction. I'd like first to go to Sunda, who's going to introduce the British Future Research. Sunda. Thank, thanks very much, John. It's great to be doing this uh, event with you and, and, and the centre. Um, just to introduce the, um, the themes of the new report, we called it Beyond a 90-Minute Nation. We think football has been important for national identity, but we want to talk about what needs to happen outside sport as well as inside sport. I think a lot of us experience national identity for the first time through sport. Um, Gareth Southgate's open letter mentions that his, his first World Cup memory is the 1982 World Cup as an 11-year-old. That's the first World Cup I remember as well. I was eight at the time. And um, the, you know, the positive thing for me when I was an eight year old is nobody had actually ever said to me, Sunda, England, Englishness, why do you think it's got anything to do with you? I was just getting my copy of Shoot magazine every week from the news agent, scouring it. Would Kevin Keegan and Trevor Brooking be fit for the World Cup? That was the key. That was the key issue in 1982. So it feels quite, it felt quite straightforward. Um, and so in that sense, in sort of national identity terms, maybe I was engaging with being English before I was engaging with being British, because the first Olympics I remember was two years later, 1984, and you had the, you know, the Olympic team, Daly Thompson, uh, Tess Sands and Fatima Whitbread, and, you know, Sevco, all the, all the great uh, athletes, but, but, you know, you're not thinking, you haven't got a theory of national identity, I think, as an eight and 10 year old person following football in the Olympics. By the time I was a teenager, of course, I realised that um, sport and identity were, you know, contested issues, um, uh, but that national identity was more complicated than that. There had been an argument about whether you could be Black and British over a period of time, and that, you know, the Olympic team perhaps had sorted that one out. Um, uh, but whether Englishness was ethnic as well, that argument happened in football. And I think football made enormous contributions to national identity in our society that comes out in this new research in two ways. Firstly, the initial Black players, the Civil Regis generation, Viv Anderson, still true of John Barnes in the 70s and 80s, they won an argument that they were English. And it, football was where we, it's where I experienced overt public racism of a scale you'd never see today. But it's where I heard about anti-racism for the first time because there was organization around football at club and country level to change the culture. But the players won the argument that the England team would have black players. And that if John Barnes scored a goal, the goal countered, which seems a really obvious thing to say, but the NF contingent in the England, as they were saying black goals don't count, they would sing the wrong score when Barnes scored in Brazil. That argument, I think, was over by 1990. Uh, and, you know, the black players were there. Um, 
a third of the players who've played for England since then have been black and mixed race. No British Asians yet in the England team. But that that won the argument. But that didn't win. That didn't change the argument about the culture we had at football. And I think largely when I was growing up, football was part of the problem of identity. Football was about hooliganism. It was about xenophobia. It was about racism. We were worried about the way in which sport and football in particular would represent identity. And yet what this research shows is that football more than anywhere else has turned up and decided to be part of the solution of identity. Italian 90 started that. We forget now, Gaza's Tears, Ness and Dorma. English clubs couldn't play in Europe at the time of Italian 90 because of the ban because of hooliganism, so the sense that you know the fans had a travelling culture that was you know xenophobic, that was violent, that you'd be singing you know if it wasn't for the English you'd be Krauts. That was there, and then Euro '96 was so important to me personally. It changed how I felt about being English because we changed the flag to the St George's flag that summer. We've never quite worked out why that happened. Uh, devolution hadn't happened yet, but we were drawn against Scotland. So perhaps people realise that. But the St George's flag went with the spirit of three lions, which wasn't to say that the uh, you know, the country that had invented the game was so arrogant it would always win. Three Lions is about how England isn't expecting to win, but still remembers that it could happen. And so the triumph of hope over expectation is happening again. So it's a very soft, inclusive, welcome to the world, host the party, be part of the party, be proud of it kind of Englishness. And I think we've had that in football, in the team, and to some extent in the culture we got in the stadiums you know, for that period now, for 25 years. And so it's interesting what the research shows, three things they show, three half glass half full stories. It's common sense now that you don't have to be white to be English. Um, uh, over three quarters of white English people think that. Um, two thirds of ethnic minorities, a slightly smaller number, are confident that, you, that Englishness is open to all ethnicities. A slightly larger number of ethnic minority respondents, one in five of our large poll saying, really you have to be white to be considered truly English. So there are a lot of people giving that answer when they regret it. And there's a smaller group giving that answer because they still think it's true, a shrinking group. Um, you know, the caller David had to deal with uh, on, on his radio show. That's a shrinking group. So that argument has gone. That, that shrinking group has a lot of profile, has a lot of, we've, we've won that argument. But what is the culture that we want to be? So it's open. You can be English if you want. Do we feel we've got an Englishness that invites us all to be part of it? And what this research shows is that the England football team for two thirds of the white population, two thirds of ethnic minorities has that status. Here is a symbol of England that belongs to people of every ethnicity and faith. But at the moment, it's the only symbol we've got that we're confident of. We're not as confident about the flag. We're not as confident about St George's Day. Younger people, younger white people and ethnic minorities are more confident about the flag during the two or three weeks when there's a tournament on than they are the rest of the year round. But an inclusive Englishness that works when we put flags on our cars and there's a tournament on isn't an inclusive Englishness that we need all year round and in society. So I think, I think the positive story about sport and football told in this research that we found a symbol and a vision of Englishness where people were being invited and we had a culture being invited. There's a problem here that the that that has, does not extend outside of the sporting sphere enough. And so I think football is top of this league of an inclusive Englishness by default, because very few other institutions and people have turned up. We're hearing from Gareth Southgate about the story of an inclusive national identity for England, as well as for Britain. We don't really hear that enough, I think, from our politicians, from our other institutions. So I think football's done a great deal to give us a glimpse and an image of the England we now are in the 2020s. The team that walks onto the pitch represents that. There are new arguments about racism uh, in sport and in society today, and the team wants to be part of those arguments. But football's made its contribution. I think this research shows that we've got to find ways to get an inclusive Englishness happening, not just through our football team, a cricket team, a rugby team, but by the other institutions in England turning up and being part of it. So that's our theme for the research. We're delighted to have other contributions. And David, I'd like to come to you um, next to share your experiences of England and Englishness and where we are today on that. Thank you very much, um, Sundar. And I think it's great that, um, that you and John and others persist at this important issue. Um, I mean, let me just say that I think I agree with you when I was 
you know, coming of age and watching Viv Anderson and John Barnes emerge into the English football team, the truth is that, that at, at that stage, um, I would have thought that Britishness was still contested as an inclusive idea. What I mean by that is that um, it was understood by those that had arrived from the Caribbean and the West Indies, those that had arrived from uh, the Indian subcontinent and, the, and Africa, that they were part of the British Empire. That was understood by them, but I'm not sure it was fully understood uh, by those that lived here because empire was far away uh, for most working people. Uh, people forget that really up until the 1980s, uh, it was unusual for the average uh, Brit to take a holiday uh, abroad and certainly much beyond France. Uh, and so there was something other, I think, um, about those that came, yes, from the British Empire, but there was, there was little understanding that they were British and there was... Um, certainly no understanding that they were English. Um, and I think the Britishness box has opened up um, and it would be interesting to explore why it has opened up, but it's probably because it's always been an identity that's been rather flexible in truth. And somehow, um, those the national heroes, particularly the Olympic Games, have played a part in a kind of pride that everyone's been able to feel about that Britishness, particularly. And it's fantastic that um, certainly the community from, that I'm from um, is keen to say that they are British, overwhelmingly, black British. Um, Englishness, however, is in a very, I think is in a much more dangerous place. And in some senses has gone into a more dangerous place in the sort of meta environment of identity politics, of global economic pressure, of inequality, of working class people, wherever they're found in Europe or in the white settler countries of Australia, Canada, the United States and beyond, but in those places, in this age in which the two major economic engines of the world, and I would see that as white working class engines in those countries and here in Europe, and black and brown people in the global south and here in Europe and in those countries, those are the engines, frankly, that make the goods, that keep things going, uh, in fact. But as those, as those communities have come under pressure, I think, and I'm afraid as populism has grown, um, uh, however you want to define that, um, there is an ethno-nationalism that's emerged and that's sort of almost doubled down on. And the truth is the inclusive Englishness that you describe, and I would actually go beyond an inclusive Englishness because what I want is a, and what I wrote about in my book was a national civic identity and to have a national civic identity, which is more than just inclusive. Frankly, Sundar, I'm gonna challenge you there a bit. I, I, that's a little bit tame and terribly English <laughs> because you see what I think we need is nation building. And nation building has become something you almost associate with new countries, like countries that have experienced tremendous pain and hardship, like Germany after the war, or Japan, or um, South Africa, uh, uh, or you know, countries that suddenly have new independence, like the Caribbean country. They're, they're in the business of nation building. And I think the English have got to be in the business of nation building. And if you're in the business of nation building, 
then your leaders, your political leaders, um, are returning to these issues on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, are choosing deliberately to identify with cultural events that are inclusive, are building a story within schools and communities that are inclusive, that are in the business of a new national story. And the irony of this moment, it seems to me, following the decision to exit the European Union, is that we have an opportunity to build that new national story or to renew that new national story. But the danger is that that national story is built on old myths. Now, I don't say that Um, cynically, because the truth is all countries tell myths about themselves. They can be incredibly helpful. (laughs) uh, But you do need some new ones as well, (laughs) is is the truth. And there's something about Englishness that I think is stuck in two places. And you see it, really, if you walk into any school and look at any history class or indeed explore um, uh, English those sorts of subjects. And those two foundational stories, I think, that are told is the powerful story of the uh, Tudors. And if you like, Henry VIII's throwing off of the Catholic Church based on his decision to marry different women, basically. But that Protestant story of England emerging uh, into this new place. That's one story and the Elizabethan era that followed it and obviously empire that followed that um, uh, period. And then the second story is winning the Second World War, often told more recently through the lens of Britain standing alone, which is a myth. I mean, it's a total, total myth. And that you can get away with a Hollywood film that takes Oscars away. (laughs) <laughs> is an indication of how great our storytellers are, because the United States is probably rather upset that we want it alone. Um, uh, I know we have a modern enmity with Russia, but I think they might be a bit upset that we want it alone. And you could certainly be conscious that my ancestors um, in the Commonwealth and in the West Indies are rather upset that we're airbrushed out of the story. And indeed, the controversy that I revealed very recently about the contribution to the First World War of African soldiers so written out the story is that that most British people do not understand one jot that there was an East Africa campaign that as many fell on the Eastern Front as the Western Front of the First World War. It's not taught in schools. People were incredulous that they didn't know this. They thought that what they heard from Sigrid Fassoon and Wilbur was it, that the Blackadder story so wonderfully conveyed was it. They had no idea that in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, the First World War was being fought as well with co-opted. Africans brought into our ranks to help us secure um, Kenya and then into Tanzania. And we had a, we were very keen as Brits to have this connection from the Nile, Egypt, right down through Africa for, for frankly, for very important strategic uh, and geopolitical reasons. So I want a civic nationalism. To get that civic nationalism, you need new, new, new stories new myths um, uh, to get that inclusive vision. Um, And you need to ground it in some new institutions. They can be old ideas, but new ones that bring about and get that working together. And now as a starter for 10 in my book, I talked about a civic national service. Um, um, I want to emphasize civic, but there has to be an element of compulsion and that is an aversion to people in my party, certainly. Um, uh, but it's really interesting that Macron uh, has gone in this direction, even though it's for a very limited period, I think it's a month in France, because he too wants to tell uh, an, a different, inclusive sort of 
story about modern France. I think what emerges with the English team is not that different from what emerged a few years ago with the French team, a team that was so diverse, uh, but personified modern France. Did it lead to a place of inclusivity in France? I've got to say, when I look at those scenes coming out of Black Lives Matter in Paris, I'm not sure it did. So this has got to be a lot deeper than sport. You know, there's been controversy this week, hasn't there, about booing and about taking the knee. Um, and they're always presented in Britain, these controversies that are not, in my view, controversies about the substance of racism, discrimination. They're, sub they're usually co controversies about language and symbol. Um, uh, and I don't actually think that we move very far on when we have those controversies, but it, was re it reminded me of the era in which I grew up and in which Nelson Mandela was still in prison and in which apartheid was still roaring and in which um, many, many people in Britain started in a progressive place but grew to be very different kinds of people in Britain, took a view on what was happening in South Africa and the importance of sanctions. And Margaret Thatcher set herself against that and uh, others, frankly, saw Nelson Mandela as a terrorist, not a freedom fighter. But what was interesting is that people began to boycott Cape Apples. Um, and they weren't just people in places like uh, the seat I represent. They were ordinary British people that were seeing the scenes on the news. And that was all they could do. Uh, and then, of course, we get to a place um, where um, the progressive ideal breaks open, that, 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 that modern values of, of, of rights uh, and responsibilities break open. And now, of course, we're in a world where everyone would say Nelson Mandela was a good guy and, uh, and people couldn't believe that anyone would be on the wrong side of the apartheid debate. But what I'm saying is... I'm not sure how different that debate, and you remember there were cricket teams that wanted to, you know, sport should be different from sanctions that wants to play out. I'm not sure that debate is that different from what we see, um, what we're hearing this week about taking the knee or indeed English players that have tweeted uh, previously racist things. So what I'm saying is you've got to go beyond sport. Sport is a signal of what is happening in the country, partly because it's so youthful. It captures where communities are today, but you've got to go deeper. That takes leadership from the top, definitely prime ministers, uh, indicating that this is important. It takes powerful new national stories, and it takes a real challenge for old European countries, and certainly ones like ours that have not been invaded, that have not had those sorts of traumas yet, exiting the European Union does present an opportunity. It is really, in the end, to get into the business of nation building. How do old European democratic powers that are broadly peaceful, how do they climb into the box that is nation building, doing so in a way that is above politics and above partisan politics, perhaps, Perhaps it is not solely through the lens of governments. It has also in our country got to be through the lens of the monarchy. And there we have had signals, certainly from Prince Charles, that he has a vision and he uses inclusive language, certainly, when he talks about being defender of all faiths. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, challenge there to go beyond inclusion as a foundation, get into nation building, which others will pick that up. And next, I'm going to introduce Anne Coddington. Anne leads the um, journalism and publishing course at the London College of Communication. She's a very experienced writer of books of journalism uh, about women who follow football, about London 2012. And uh, I first met Anne 25 years ago. We were part of a small voluntary group of supporters organising a fans festival interested in this cultural change. Anne, give us your uh, view. OK, well, thank you. I mean, I think I'd like to start by saying Euro 96. Um, I remember it very well. Again, it was one of my first engagements with Englishness. I don't think I'd really thought about what it meant to be English before that. 
and I can I can remember the tournament really vividly. I mean, the sun was shining, and there were all kinds of people in that stadium. You know, there were women, there were children, there was the the sort of the humor, there was the singing three lions on the shirt. And it felt to me at that time, you know, incredibly inclusive. I, I was sort of drawn into this culture. We were all united by this shared goal of wanting the, the team to win. And there was a real sense, I think, of, of belonging about that. And I think as a moment, that's an incredibly potent reminder about what football can do. It's about emotion. It's about feeling. You know, I remember sitting behind in the, the sort of the England-Germany game, the famous game that went to penalties. Um, you know, I was sitting there with a big strapping scaffolder from Bolton. You know, it got tattoos and, you know, he was almost in tears. I can't look. I can't look at these penalties. And people sort of displayed their emotions, their vulnerabilities. And I think you sort of came away from that feeling that you'd had an experience, a real experience. And but I think that is just one moment. And I think sometimes we can think about things like Euro 96 and think, oh, yes, that means it's an inclusive Englishness. But actually, it isn't. It's it's the opportunity for something like that. I think it. it, it commemorates or it, it, it's an instance of an opportunity but actually an inclusive Englishness around sport is actually something that has to be built and it takes an enormous amount of time to to build that you know if Euro 96 is one moment as a as a, a traveling fan as somebody who has um followed England you know for 16 years across four world cups four European championships home and away you know euro 96 is one version but but there's another version and it's about a set of very um rigid fans it's it's about a fandom that really doesn't want to engage with difference it's a fandom that doesn't want to engage with with women um, it doesn't want to end, you know, it's about singing 10 German bombers. It's about singing No Surrender. It's about saying that, you know, well, we're just into the football. We don't want to have conversations about anything else, despite the fact that singing 10 German bombers and No Surrender is, you know, has political connotations. And it's about not really wanting to have that conversation about Englishness. So it's a kind of, it's a stop, both to a kind of inclusivity, you know, it's, it's, it's hostile, it's aggressive. You know, I remember I've been in, you know, I've sat down in front of fans who stood up and I wouldn't dare say, excuse me, could you sit down please? You know, it, it's about an unwillingness to have that kind of conversation that I think, I think we need to have. And I think, you know, that's the issue around sport and Englishness, as I think Sundar said and David has said, we can't expect sport to be the sole means of doing this. You know, as we've seen with players taking the knee, it can initiate a conversation. And I think that's really important. And I think that what Gareth Southgate has done is a real aspect of leadership. I think he's really demonstrated leadership in, in sort of sending out that letter. You know, but, but sport, if sport is the only symbol that we have of English, then I think, that's, I think that's really difficult because we have this great, you know, multicultural vision of sport with the, fa with, with the footballers, um, but the, the fans, it, it's much more mixed. You know, the, the, the people who come to see that sport, it's a microcosm what's going on in society and that is that's much more mixed and that's much more difficult and I think that's why we need as David is saying new symbols um yeah I think you know the St George you know St George's Day commemorating that I think that's that's really important and I know that it's on a Saturday next year 
But I think the challenge is, is to think, well, what are we going to do with that? You know, so we may celebrate St George's Day, but how are we actually going to do that? And what does it mean beyond saying we're having a day off? You know, I think how we might celebrate that in, in Tottenham, for example, is going to be very different to how we might celebrate it in Southampton, say, or in Lewis, where I live. But what are those symbols? What are those feelings? What are those gestures? You know, the things that really appeal to me from Euro 96, which was about a kind of authenticity, a feeling of connection. I don't, when I think of Englishness beyond the team, I sort of have a bit of a vacant space. You know, we could talk about, I could talk about Monty Python, I could talk about Faulty Towers, but we don't have a language to kind of talk about those as being, as being English. We don't quite know, you know, I come from Yorkshire and I have quite a sense of identification with Yorkshire. You know, it might be about having a Northern accent, it might be about being dour and a particular kind of humor, but I have some kind of connection. When I think about Englishness, I'm not quite sure what it is. And, and I think that kind of needs unpacking more and we need more language for it and more vision. And I mean, this is purely anecdotal in terms of teaching at a college with lots of young people. You know, we have lots of people like to talk about identity, like to talk about their sexual identity or um, race, ethnicity, but, but not many talk about Englishness. And I think there's a reason for that. They're not quite sure how to approach it or how to unpack it. You know, people talk a lot about Britishness. And I think, as Sunder's saying, things have really moved on. And I think, you know, and I think that's really good. But it's almost like we need more, more sort of flesh on the bone now to, to kind of make sense of what it can be and what the potential for that can be. Thank, thank you, Anne. Um, James Kirkup, director of the Social Market Foundation and a, a Telegraph columnist over, over a long period. Uh, tell us how to talk about England. <laughs> thank you, Sander. Um, to, well, to add to my, my dubious CV, I should, also, I should add and confess, no, non-football fan. So I'm in, uh, you're being very inclusive by inviting me to this event. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose, well, 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 I'd pretty start by you know, return to sort of the original essay question that we, we were set for, for for the panel, which is, uh, you know, is you know, is football enough? I suppose. And going back to your, your, your the very good polling that you published today, um, I mean, bluntly, I, I think that polling suggests quite strongly that the that football alone is not enough to uh, to build an inclusive idea of, of England and Englishness. Because when, for for all you know, there's lots of positives in there. You, you're right to stress them. You've got non-trivial numbers of people who, on one side, think that England and Englishness is not for them, that they are excluded from it, and you've got non-trivial numbers of people who actually are quite happy to exclude from their idea of Englishness another group of people, you know, often on the grounds of, uh, of race. Um, so, yeah, and, and that takes place in the background of, now, I don't know how many, you know, uh, you know several years, decades even, of visibly multi-ethnic sporting teams and sort of, you know, those occasional signs and symbols of, of inclusion. So, I mean, you know, by self-evidently, football alone is not, is not going to be enough. And I, you know, I very strongly agree with lots of the things David said, and I'll, I'll come, uh, I will come back to that in, in, in a moment. Um, uh, so, what, I mean, obviously that, that raises the question, if that's not enough, what, you know, what is? Um, I mean, at the risk of sort of you know, questioning the whole premise of the exercise here, um, why don't we have a look at uh, another country in the UK that actually has managed to develop a national identity that is probably more inclusive without, uh, you know, without making much use of sport, uh, which is Scotland. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, and I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm almost Scottish. I'll come, I'll come on to where I'm from in a, in a moment. Um, I think it's very striking that uh, Scottishness is, you know, we can, we can overstate it, Scottishness is probably a more inclusive identity than Englishness, uh, particularly when you look at the experience of, uh, of Asian Scots. And that's been done without um, multi-ethnic sporting teams. I think, again, I'm not an expert, 
yeah, I think there have been incredibly few uh, ethnic minority players for in any any Scottish national team, and yet Scotland has constructed a, an identity for itself, which is more inclusive because proving the, you know, the, the central point I think you know, David and everybody's made because lots of people frankly in Scotland spend a lot more time talking about Scottishness possibly too much um, I speak as a I speak as a former uh, political editor of the Scotsman it, it's possible you, know, you can you can you, you can obsess about this stuff too much but yeah and this is actually how I came to this debate I suppose you know, 15 20 years ago uh, writing for the Scotsman and you know, about Scottishness, and actually more, I used to write more than more, more about Englishness um, uh, for the Scotsman, because actually the Scots are quite interested in the development of, of, of English national identity in a way that for many years uh, the English were not, and still to to a large extent, uh, to a large extent aren't. Um, so I suppose what's the you know um, yeah the the, the biograph bi biographical bit I suppose um, I was just you know, I was you know, thinking about this when. Uh, you were talking, Sunday. Sunday, you, you talked about your, your when you first became aware, aware of England. Um, and I, again, I, you know, to be clear, as a non-football fan of a similar vintage to you, I mean, I, it's a funny thing. I, I you know, grew up all very conscious of of, of 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 the idea of England because I grew up. I think it's about in a straight line, seven or eight miles from the Scottish border. I'm from Northumberland, uh, and so. By definition, almost, we understood that we were in England because Scotland was on the other side of the hill. Not that there's no, no hostility there, or you know, I'm from a place of you know, sheep and sheep and shepherds, and you know, the sheep, the sheep wander, the sheep wander, wander either side of the trivia, you know, the trivia and the borderline, nobody minds. Um, but we, you know, we are aware of, uh, we are aware, aware of identity there because it's, you know, it's quite vivid. I mean, I, you know, I'm, you know, I was back home. I still think it's think of it as home, even though I've been gone 27 years. In my you know my village last weekend, and uh, the, you know, the, the English flag is is flying over the over the church as it does every day and always has done. You know, you know, no, nobody ever remarks about that. That's just a, a statement of fact. It, it's implicitly that's that say you know, it's there because we're you because well, it's the church in England, but also because we're not Scottish. Um, uh, and I think that that you know, that uh, idea you know, um, uh, yeah, that's you know, one thing. You know, well, the reason why you know, Northumbrianism, I think, is important here. Um, if I'll, I'll, I'll try not to digress into a, you know, my uh, my long-standing you know, view that we should probably go back to the Heptarchy and, and re refound the kingdom of Northumberland. I'll, I'll you know, pass over my historic grievance against, against the Vikings, but um, Northumberland is obviously quite a long way away from a lot of the rest of England, where it's about as, as, as north as you can go and still be in England. And so I grew up simultaneously aware of being English and yet aware of a great deal of distance from what I think we probably understood as being the proper English, yeah, idea of Englishness, which had something to do with green lawns and croquet and cucumber sandwiches and possibly yeah, quite, well, cricket, which is played really, really popular in, in Northumberland. Um, and I think that is where this conversation needs to go. And I it's a theme that I heard from from you. Well, I know, well, I, I know is present in your thinking on, the, on this Sunday as a you know, uh, as an Evertonian. Um, I think and and uh, Anne particularly you mentioned it when she talked about Yorkshire. Um, and I think the question I'm curious to explore here, I'd be interested in you know, other opinions from the panel and uh, and the audience, uh, is about is about plural ideas of Englishness. Because David, David's absolutely right. In, in in our in our lifetimes. Britishness has been expanded to take in the hyphen. Um, you know, you know, it has been established that it is possible to be British and something else. Um, and that's generally a positive thing. And yet Englishness is still singular. I mean, there's a, you know, for some people, I think Englishness is what you've got if you've got, if you haven't got a hyphen, if you've got nothing else, it's the, it's the identity of last resort. Uh, which actually is not a, I mean, that's not a healthy or even accurate way of looking at it because nobody is only English. Everybody who is, even the English, the English not, not British, a very important group that I know, John, John, you've done a lot of work on, even the English not British will have other identities, whether or not they're, you know, they're regional identities, whether or not they're Cockneys, Geordies, you know, you know, Everton fans, you know, you know, you know, whatever they are, everyone's got something else as well. And I think we need to talk more about how we combine our English identities with other identities as well, and not have, you know, essentially bring down the barriers around Englishness and you know, have, have, you know, admit that we have a lot of overlapping 
and overlaid identities. Uh, and football, I think, could be, uh, insofar as I understand that strange game that it is, could be a, a way to start that conversation because it is possible, like you, Sunder, to be a, you know, a deeply committed England fan, hence the shirt, while also caring very deeply about the, uh, about the prog uh, progress of, you know, of Everton. Um, we, we're all more than one thing. Um, and I think we need to move away from the idea of, of, of Englishness as a, as a singular identity. And that, that, I mean, that can't be done just by, you know, just by the odd sporting tournament. And it certainly can't be done by the odd tea party on St George's Day. I mean, that's absolutely right about the idea of a collective, you know, a wider nation building effort. I, I think to split the difference between you, know, between you, know, that you identified David between yourself and, uh, and Sandra, I think you're right that we should be engaged in a process of nation building. I just don't think we should call it that or even admit that we're doing it. Um, because that's surely the, the English way is to actually do something but not actually make a big fuss about it. Uh, and in the instant you actually start saying we're going to build an Englishness and we're going to define English values and we're going to have a, a process of, you know, of, of nation building, I don't remember all think, oh God, that's, that's not our sort of thing. We should just do it without, we, we should just do it without, without putting a label on it or a name on it. And, you know, I'm going to postulate that telling anybody. So that's my, uh, yeah, my, 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 clo my closing thought, I suppose. Let's, yeah, let's work out how we, can, how, we can, how we can be English and something else. Let's bring in, bring in the hyphen. Thanks, thanks, James. So plural evolutionary nation building there. John, the constant theme of this uh, has been sport gives us a moment to have this conversation, but we need to do things outside sport. Tell us, tell us what we should do. You're muted, John. Thank you, sir. Yes, I mean, I actually wanted to talk about the many organisations that could help build an inclusive Englishness, but duck it at the moment. Now, the first bit of good news is that Englishness is actually becoming more inclusive of its own accord, despite this lack of engagement. It's already the case that one in three ethnic minorities not only identify strongly as English, but are proud of it too. The idea that Englishness is closed is wrong, and your own research shows that there's a much bigger potential pool right now of people who say that Englishness is open to all, even though they haven't personally signed up to it as an identity yet. So the scope to do this is huge. The second bit of good news is that inclusive Britishness didn't just happen. It was actively built by people from the grassroots civic society organisations and indeed the state who went out to shape an inclusive national identity. But it was done for Britishness. That shows it can be done for national identities. And it's been done in Scotland, as James has said, Englishness hasn't had the same attention. And the reason we can't be complacent is that Englishness is still contested. Unfortunately, the small number of people who insist on Englishness being white are often reinforced by some on the liberal left who also insist, in spite of the evidence that Englishness can only be white. It's critical, I would suggest, that national identities are national and not communitarian. So we have to keep working on that. Secondly, over the past 20 years, identities in England have become much more associated with political positions than they used to be. The more English were more likely to vote leave, the more British more likely to vote remain. But I would argue that in a healthy nation, we want these big political debates to take place within shared national identities, not between different national identities. And there's also some geographical and demographic challenges. Um, people who are more likely to emphasize their English identity are more or live in larger numbers outside the big cities. They're a bit older on average. They're less likely to be graduates than the more British. And again, I'd suggest we don't want to live in a nation in which national identities become markers of a town versus city argument or a red wall against London argument. That would be very damaging. So I tried in my piece to set out eight principles that I would address to all the organizations in civic society, political parties, institutions, the rest of it, who could be helping in this project. The first one is if you work in or serve England, talk about England. It's quite extraordinary how organizations, including political parties, will talk about Wales and Scotland, but in England mumble about the country or even Britain. Uh, I noticed that Keir Starmer today retweeted Gareth Southgate's article, but Keir Starmer, 
is another Labour leader who never talks about England. In fact, since Michael Foote, there has only been one, and that was Ed Miliband, and he only did it once. And the same thing can be said of other political parties. Now, if in England as a nation, which has its own boundaries and its own policies, is marginalised, then English identity is marginalised too, by definition. Secondly, promote inclusive in images of Englishness. A student of mine a couple of years ago did a survey of local council websites and other some national organizations promoting St George's Day events. Nearly every participant was white. This type of celebration of St George's Day is making things worse, not better. Uh, thirdly, tell shared stories. National identities above all are the stories we share of who we are and how we came to be here and what we value in common. And we actually need to create the opportunities to listen to each other so that England's story expands to include the stories of those whose families came more recently here and here from those of us, uh, most with migrant blood somewhere, who have longer roots in England. So it's a shared story. Uh, fourthly, don't promote or reinforce outdated representations of English identity. Last year, The Guardian illustrated a story about racial violence with a caricature of a skinhead wearing a St George's Cross t-shirt. The Guardian would be the first paper to complain about other forms of stereotyping, but didn't mind labeling the four out of five who feel strongly English as all racists. And it happens far too much. Fifthly, celebrating English identity. I mean, I sort of feel the fact that St George's Day isn't a huge national festival actually gives us more scope to de develop celebrations that are inclusive from the outset. And in some of my own, uh, some, some of my own work here in, in Southampton, you know, we've did everything from primary school curriculum work on what modern dragons needed slaying, uh, the local newspaper running a St George's Day Community Award with nominations from all parts of the city and small grants to community organisations to organise events. You can make these things work. Sixth, not too many more of these, join the local with the national. It's already been mentioned. Most people who feel English often identify strongly as well with a part of England. But because local identities are often shared strongly across ethnic groups, linking the celebration of the local to the national can be a really powerful way of saying everyone who is from here can also be English. Uh, and inclusive Englishness benefits all of us. I mean, it's pretty clear from this research that there's a section of the white majority who draw back from St George's Day and the flag because of the connotations that have been attached to Englishness. So actually, by promoting an inclusive Englishness, we can let, if you like, this reluctant group too, to share an English identity. And my final point is don't be scared. And I mean this because I've had several consultations as director of the centre with major national organisations over the last year that have wanted to engage with England and English identity, but have been fearful that doing so in some way would mean that they were associating themselves with all the negative connotations of Englishness. Well, of course, it's not true. Englishness is overwhelmingly not like that. Uh, but the more organisations who engage in this, the easier it will be for everyone to do. So those are my sort of practical thoughts on how different organisations can go about approaching the issue. And now I think with that seamless continuity, I'm going to switch from speaking uh, to chairing the Q&A session. Apologies if I disappeared behind my notes there for a moment. Um, I'm going to, um, as a quick reminder to people, there's, there, there's, we're, we're going to work from your Q&A questions, so uh, please uh, do put them in. I'll take as many as I can. I'd like to start with one, and I'll start with Sunder because of the research, really. Two people, um, John Howarth and Oliver Barrett, and uh, forgive me for paraphrasing, but essentially raised the question of the flag outside us. John Howarth asserts that the English flag has been captured by the far right. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if the research really shows that. I always note that, with the exception of the English Defence League, all fascist organisations in Britain have always been British by name and by use of flag. But has it been captured by the far right? And Oliver Barrett's question is slightly differently. Is the fear of flying the English flag because of the association with a distasteful nationalism? Um, Sunder, can you tell us what the research says on that one for a start? Yes, it, it's not that it's the far right. As you say, far right groups are, are, are tiny. 
um, and you know, even at their biggest, their time. It's that sense that it represents something exclusionary, and that the people who like it are not being inclusive. And um, views are ambivalent about this. Um, it's a flag that divides opinion more. You know, the, the Scottish and Welsh flags are, are pretty ubiquitous flags. The British flag has become increasingly so. The Union Jack would polarise people in Scotland. It's the English flag that, that people have views about whose flag it is and whose flag it isn't. So in this, in this research, we've got, um, we've got during a tournament, and these, these aren't the highest numbers either, 60% of the white English and almost half ethnic minorities are saying it's good and it's healthy then. Um, but still a quarter saying, I don't like it then. And outside of a tournament, at a normal time, we've got, we've got um, four out of 10 ethnic minorities and half of the white population. Only half of the white population saying that's a healthy sign of patriotism. So you can see a big part of the white population as well thinking, I don't really know what people are doing with that. So I think if you don't normalise it and use it, um, at events across the country to which everyone is invited. Some people will always say, because of some of the people who are associated with it, I wouldn't want it to be the thing that we use. Okay. Um, I don't know if any other panelists want to come in on that. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to carry as many as I can. Um, this probably one is, is one for, uh, certainly for David and for James, I'd say to start with. Um, Jacqueline Landsman's question, which is, can civic nationalism be bipartisan to counter, if not beat, the current cultural wars? I think, as I understand that, you know, if we are successful in this nation building or inclusive Englishness, can it take some of the heat out of the cultural wars that we have at the moment? Uh, David, could I come to you on that? For sure. Um, absolutely. Um, I'm going to tell a little story. I'm not sure if I've written about this, but... Um, in the run-up to Gordon Brown becoming the leader of the Labour Party, uh, Gordon was definitely in a consultative, consultative mood uh, with um, members of the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, and certainly with ministers. Uh, John Denham will remember this. And I think I can say that one of the things that clearly had come up um, in some of the focus group work that was being done at the time was, was you know, there, there was definitely some raising the fact that he was Scottish. So he was doing quite a lot of thinking about an inclusive identity. And one of the things that I sent up and suggested was that he might consider um, doing what they do in other countries, which is abolishing the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. <laughs> it's quite radical. Uh, and bringing it into the Prime Minister's office. There are other parts of the world, I think they did this in New Zealand, where the Prime Minister wears that culture, media and sport in their office as a way to, to celebrate and define a kind of modernity and inclusivity. Um, and in countries like New Zealand, where you want to symbolise that you want to, I'm with a Maori, and with a, it, it becomes quite important. And I sent this suggestion through. Uh, it was promptly rejected. Uh, but, but I suppose this was an era in which there was still an understanding, I think, that prime ministers could occasionally sit above the sort of party fray. Um, I don't think we're in that era at the moment. <laughs> and there's a very strong... I mean, I thought David Cameron could sometimes sit above... He sat sometimes above the party the party knockabout. You know, when he was hugging a hoodie, um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, or asking me to do a review on the... He was sort of sitting above the knockabout. And so definitely it's got to be bipartisan. Um, uh, it's got to be, it's got to feel beyond, uh, part, it, almost it's got to feel grubby to, to, to make it party political. And that's why I suggested that it probably needs some relationship with the monarchy. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the question was, can, can, can civic nationalism, um, essentially beat the culture war yes it can i think and hopefully it will it will yeah, it will but i think that will require I mean, lots of things that david has just talked about 
Um, and bluntly, I mean, it, it probably does require more people in politics as well. I mean, I, I, you, uh, you know, I, I agree about the need to take it, take, yeah, involve institutions out, outside uh, party politics. But I think actually what's also missing is a better, more thoughtful, nuanced engagement with this question by people who are in politics, too many of whom are a little bit scared to do. You are still wary of, wary of talking about Englishness. Um, and we can see in that, you know, in that vacuum, uh, you can just see how the culture war dynamic is starting to creep in. And so, you know, in you know, the conversations about, I, I use convers the term conversation lightly, uh, conversations around uh, England players taking the knee, you can see people who are interested in using this as a, a, a as a as a wedge issue. It is part of uh, yeah. There are people in, in you know, practitioners in politics, generally on the right of centre, who see English identity sublimated and expressed as being a key driver of uh, of their vote. Um, and I think I think there are the challenges probably more here on. Well, there are, there are challenges for lots of people in politics. There are challenges for people on the, the one nation side of conservative politics to try you know, to, to rise above that, uh, to try and uh, yeah, engage with a, an idea of Englishness that is, is, is more inclusive than exclusive. But also there is a, yeah, there is a real challenge for uh, people on the progressive side of politics. I mean, bluntly, I, I think it would be a very good thing if a lot more people in David's party, his colleagues in the front bench and his leader talked about this stuff in the way that David does. Um, yeah, uh, I think it, you know, it would be better if it was not left to, you know, you know some of these, you know, you know, yeah, left on the margins. Uh, uh, and so, you know, to, to hark back a little bit to, to the pre to preceding you know, question about the flag, but it's a, you know, a, a, you know, a thought experiment, I suppose. Can you imagine what would happen if, in the current climate, if a national politician uh, of either party gave a speech? Wearing the English flag on the lapel, or you know, or, 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 or in, in the backdrop of their of their of their Zoom screen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a former, sometimes somewhat recovering journalist. Um, I still commit the odd crime of journalism. I, I can tell you, I can I can almost script for you now the the op-ed pieces that we've written on both sides of the debate about isn't it marvelous to see someone flying the English flag? Isn't it terrible to see someone pay you know, someone pandering to, to, to racism? Um, which is just a, just a, a miserable limited dialogue. Uh, and we're only going to get away from that when we actually get uh, you know, grown-ups on both sides of the, you know, of the political divide saying, you know what, this is you know, this is bigger than that. It's about you know, it's about more than short-term point scoring and, and voting. So yes, I, yeah, I think uh, civic nationalism can uh, you know, you know, beat the culture war, um, but I will, uh, and I hope it will. I don't know if it would, but I don't know if that will necessarily happen. Let's hope so. Thank you, James. Uh, the next one I'm going to put to Anne, I think, from Mark English, which is an interesting one. Mark suggests that um, most English football fans, leaving aside the race, the, the, the minority we've talked about, most fans have sort of got over 1966 and now approach tournaments with a deep sense of foreboding that things might not turn out that well. I paraphrase his question. Uh, but I'm asking whether in politics it isn't a bit different, that we're still living on the, the myth of English or British exceptionalism, which uh, and he has su suggests, therefore, it's English football has become more relaxed than perhaps than the nation has a, as, as a whole, and therefore politically we're less likely to be inclusive. Do you think there's, a, there's an insight there into our difference of national attitude towards football and our national attitude towards politics? Um, yeah, I and, think I think that's I think that's interesting. I mean, I think um, I think we don't have the debate about Englishness either. I suppose I, I think we don't have the debate about Englishness properly, either in terms of football or in terms of outside of, of politics. So I just think, are we more, I mean, I don't know if I think we're more, re we're more relaxed. I think people, there are people within football who think they know what Englishness is. They think it's the flag. They think it's you get behind the cut, you know, you get behind the team and you're there for the team. But then I think it starts to kind of fall apart because for some England fans, then yes, they like, they're behind the team when they play on the pitch. 
but they actually don't like things like taking the knee. Suddenly, whenever somebody doesn't like something, it's about, well, you're bringing politics into it. You know, politics and sport are in, in, inexorably linked. So I think, um, you know, and we see that with things like the, the, the taking the knee. Suddenly people, people don't like it and, and can be very vocal about it. Um, and I think there are, all sort, there are all kinds of aspects of things that we associate with Englishness that, that are happening within that stadium. You know, so for example, in terms of things that, that, that kind of make me feel a bit more uncomfortable and things that are connected to Englishness. So for example, you know, I'm a Republican and there are times when I don't feel that comfortable about singing the national anthem. But what I don't do is I don't boo and I respect the fact that other people would like to do that. So I stand up, you know, I gather my thoughts while we're singing and I, you know, accept that others like to show, demonstrate their, their English feeling through that sort of celebration and that ritual. But I, I sort of, you know, that's not something that I'd like to do. So it is a kind of, it, it is a sort of opposition, but it's about how you show that opposition. So I think within, within uh, sport and Englishness, there are all kinds of tensions around what Englishness is and what it, and what it can be. But some of them, I think, are far more vocal and, and far more um, articulated, sometimes very badly and very loudly, and others and others aren't, but I think, and I think sort of maybe more broadly outside, again, I think, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about quite what it means to be English, but that's also, that, that's all also a process, you know, having been in Germany um, for the, the 2006 World Cup, you know, I remember German people being really, really hesitant about the flag wherever you went people say no I don't know you know I don't think we want to fly the flag in Germany it's it's nationalistic and by the end of that tournament people were feeling really rather relaxed about it and gosh isn't this great we can be a country that that flies our flag and sort of feels all right about that so um yeah thank you I now get, I'm put this next question to everybody but for brief answers is possible, please. We haven't got a lot of time left. The thorny question of England, Scotland and Wales. And I, I won't name all the questioners, but there are three issues coming up here. One is Gareth Young, I haven't seen the poll myself, but says there's a YouGov poll out saying today that there's more support for players taking the knee in England than in Wales and Scotland. So do we beat ourselves up too much? Somebody else has asked whether a problem with Englishness is it has been too sh much shaped by how people in Wales and Scotland and perhaps Ireland have talked about uh, Englishness. And uh, a, th a third question essentially was about forthcoming games with, um, with England and how they may play into this discussion and how Englishness is represented. So please don't try to feel you have to answer all of those, but on the England, Scottish, Welsh, Irish sounds on those terrible jokes uh, question. Who would like to say something? Sundra, I'm going to come to you, Pats, first. Yes, it's, I mean, it is complicated. And, you know, Euro 96, just before devolution, I think the English are starting to realise that they've tended to talk about England and British at the same time. And that therefore talking about Englishness is going, to, is going to take time. I think the reason it matters, national identities matter broadly when they're citizenship identities, but all the ones you give public recognition matter and so you want the ones that give public recognition to you to be open and to belong to people i think we just got to get relaxed when we don't speak to people in wales and scotland they would welcome a conversation in england about englishness that separates it out i think a lot of people in wales scotland would prefer that the you know the united kingdom national anthem was used for the olympic team and that the english team should also choose something english like jerusalem because it separates it out but it's interesting to be a multinational society where everybody, most people, most people associate with a couple of flags and do different things with them at different times. I think we should talk about why 
that makes sense to us in our lives as sporting fans, in our lives generally, so that it's not always that every issue in every part of the UK is a tug of war as to which one you're going to be really in the end, because you could go on for a long time deciding to be both. Thank you. David. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, clearly on that point about taking the knee, I think Anne put it appropriately up. I don't think it's a new idea for some people to have a view on um, politics and sport not going together. And it's why I vote the anti-apartheid movement and the vex rows that existed about sanctions and whether sport should be played in South Africa in the 80s. It's a similar debate. Uh, the question is the booing and how British or English is the booing. And we ought to have more of a conversation, uh, particularly in this era, this social media era, of a sort of a way of behaving where we used to be. Certainly the English were associated with being incredibly well-mannered. That was what being English was about. And that seems to have got rather lost. And I think it'd be rather nice to bring that back. But clearly, um, devolution has um, created a sort of settlement in Wales and Scotland. Um, and I find it interesting that in both in Wales and Scotland, you saw this in their census, but I get a sense um, that certainly in Scotland, there's a much more inclusive sense of Scottishness than I could ever have expected. Um, and that Sawar is well at home and people it's and there is no sense at all and i hope this isn't political to say that um the smp peddle anything in his um uh parents identity or any any sense that he's anything other than scottish that's a huge advance it seems to me on some of what we're seeing here um in england um so um We've got a lot to do, and I think one of the questions relates to that devolution settlement. It opens up questions about an English assembly and how that English identity is represented constitutionally. Uh, I mean, that's in a way a subject for a separate debate and discussion, but it's a very valid debate and discussion because all is not well, I think, in the way that 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 settlement occurred and where it's left English identity and why English identity is being dragged to this place that feels just too uh, ethno-nationalistic. Thank you, David. James and then Anne. Two, well, two very brief points. Um, one, I just on the, on the original on the question of around you know, England, Scotland and others, I'll just re I really reiterate you know, earlier on, Based on, as in my experience for several years of writing, writing about you know, politics and uh, and nations in Scotland for Scots, um, that there is a much better developed debate and better understanding of questions of Englishness um, in outside England within you know, within the Union, and I think that's you know, that you know, there, there's a, there's a you know, there's a suggestion made. I think someone made in in, in, in chat panel somewhere that there's a there's a hesitancy among English politicians and others to explore Englishness for fear of causing offence or for somehow the, the, the stronger assertion of English identity might uh, somehow provoke, you know, uh, provoke further Scottish nationalism and an advance of uh, the SNP cause. I'm not sure that's true. I think the nature of you know, Scottish debate about national identity is such that uh, if the English were to assert themselves more as, a, as, a, as an identity, I don't think that would worry or trouble anyone in Scotland quite as much as is sometimes imagined in England. So um, I, you know, I, I think uh, that should be, uh, that shouldn't, you know, not, 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 not a concern that people back. I just want to pick up um, and basically very strongly agree, sorry to have violent agreement on the panel, with uh, what David was saying, which I think followed on from Anne's points about, about taking the knee. Um, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, that uh, yeah, somebody should be very strongly, and I may try and do this in a column somewhere, and so if someone commissioned me soon, um, that uh, yeah, booing people who take the knee is a fundamentally un-English thing to do. It's not polite. Uh, it's perfectly, you know, you know, of course, obviously acceptable to, to take the view that you, you know, people should not do that, that you, you would not want to do it yourself, 
but expressing that opinion, frankly, in an you know, impolite way, should not be seen as English. Um, and I think uh, I think uh, yeah, Sandra um, uh, mentioned earlier on. I mean, yeah, David not long ago came sort of had some experience of this on his on, on his radio show uh, when someone called in. David, you, you remember, you essentially said you 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 couldn't you couldn't be English. Um, and your you, your reply, I'm sure most people here saw it, was quintessentially English. It was extraordinarily polite um, and thoughtful and mannered and courteous. And I thought that was yeah the, the quintessence of. Uh, an English response to some of the some of the issues that, we, that, that we're talking about here, and I think we, we should have an awful lot more of that. Thank you. And I'm going. Excuse me if I cut you off, but I'm going to go straight to a quick fire round, and then mm -hmm. last ask uh, uh, Sunda just to make any closing remarks. One of the questions being asked, and I apologise to questioners who we've I've not got your questions, but. The aim of this seminar was all about how do we get other organizations to take up this channel and one of our anonymous attendees said, how do we persuade civic society organizations and others to overcome their fear of engaging with Englishness. So quick fire ad from each person, one idea of something we can do to persuade these reluctant civic society organizations to engage with Englishness. And everyone's now worried that well, Sunder knows it's going to come to him last, which is quite unfair because he spends his life thinking about these issues. Uh, but I'm actually going to go uh, James first, then David, then Anne, and finally Sunder and to say any closing remarks as well. Great. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's good for me because I, I get, you know, I get to go for the easy answer. Fly the flag. I, I think, you know, I, I think doing what Sundra is doing today um, in the background is, yeah, is perfect. Is perfect. And, and it's very important for people, bluntly, who, who have more credibility, more status, more standing among those civil society institutions um, to do that. So, I mean, that probably is a comment. I mean, I run a cross-party think tank, so I, I usually give advice to people across politics, but in this case, I'm probably talking more to people on the left than the right, but I think people on the progressive side should be more willing to fly that flag and say, you know what, this is, you know, this is, you know, you know, I, I, I'm English, this is Englishness, it's, you know, it's okay. Fly the flag. David. Well, um, what's happening is, is getting better. You know, when the sun is doing a double pager, on an inclusive Englishness, something is happening. Uh, participating in this event has reminded me about my LBC show. And on Saturday, I texted my producer while I was speaking and said, can we do an hour on Englishness? To which he said, great idea. Now I said, don't worry, I'll get Sunder or John on to kick off the debate. I think it's Sunder's turn because John did it last time, but it would help if I had a voice that was against, and this forum has largely been a forum of shared minds. So I, it, we do need the counter argument that somehow Englishness is a limited identity. What's happening here? This is all very woke because it generates a discussion. And I think we're on the winning side of this discussion, but we've got to have the discussion. So I need your help with that. But I, I think we should be more optimistic because something is happening. Thank you, David. Anne. Well, I think we need to update tea and cake, basically. You know, English tea, slice of cake. Let's have a street party, you know, and let people bring their, their different foods. Let's, let's join together. We can fly the flag, we can talk about it, but, but let's do this updating. You know, there are some good traditions around Englishness, but they need to be updated. Yes, we can have tea, but we can have other things. Let's try different types of tea. Let's let's bring people together to share things. And I think it's it's that kind of sharing in communities with people that you don't know. That's what's powerful about sport is it brings a lot. You know, you get to meet all sorts of people that you wouldn't normally meet in everyday life. So we need more forums to, to, to do that, that are that, that are, are actually located in communities and, and are not just on on social media you know where we we share our culture we share things with each other we share food those you know i think those can be can be really powerful thank you and sunda and with the thanks to you for the research that has prompted all of this but your thoughts anna's, anna's got it exactly right the answer to the question is to go ahead and do it and it will go better than you fear that it would and you'll be surprised by 
how that works, but you have to get over the fear to do that. We actually asked the question in an earlier piece of research, why doesn't more happen on St George's Day? And people feel it should. And there were two less popular answers that were popular with a particular group. That, that rejectionist minority that wants it to be exclusive, um, you know, resentfully said, um, we're not allowed to because of the ethnic minorities. And then the sort of the liberal sort of quarter of society, the most popular answer in that group was nobody cares. And you think, well, someone else cares. But the, the, the most popular answer was um, things aren't organised. Nobody organises anything. And so there's a large sort of armchair willingness that isn't going to go and organise a street party, but would come along. And then it's very interesting if you say, of course, we could mark St George's Day as well as St Patrick's Day in England. Let's keep marking St Patrick's Day as well. Let's do St George's Day and invite everybody to the party. Some minorities are surprised that they're welcome to attend. Some of the majority population are surprised that the minority population will turn up. And so there's reassurance in the fact because it's a contested identity, it turns into meaningful contact. We need organisations. We've got a lot of bonding in this society. We need organisations to overcome the fear and offer to be the bridges in our society to make contact on the issue where it feels like you might be nervous of it. And it's very English to feel nervous about people you don't know, and then to find out that it can work. So I hope people will get in touch, John, with, with you at the center, with us at British Future. There are examples locally of people who've done that. I live in Dartford where this is done very, very well. For St. George's Day as it is, John, where you were in Southampton, but other people are not doing it because they think it might kick off. And actually people are surprised and reassured and happier when it turns out that we do want a party we can all be invited to. Sunda, thank you very much. That's a great note to end on. Thanks to all the participants. I'm sorry I didn't get through all of the questions. Uh, there's some great stuff on the chat as well. To David, James and, and Sunda and all of you who've taken part, thank you very much indeed. And we'll post the video as soon as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you.